Thank you, Steve. Last year, I was reading an article, and the author had suggested that in the prior two years, the United States had been through a test. The author did not say who gave us the test or administered it, but that the test was the pandemic, and that the test was to help us see whether we were actually the United States of America, to see how were we doing on that road to forming a more perfect union. You might not be surprised to hear that the person concluded that we had done poorly on the test. There were certainly affirmations of some things that were discovered and learned and creativity. I mean, the healthcare workers, oh my goodness, what they did. Or teachers pivoting almost week to week, trying to figure out how to educate people, students in this thing. Scientists, incredible research and development that went on. And of course, there were politicians and talking heads, many who knew better who inflamed around conspiracy theories. Things like, a mask is a sign of Satan. Or the vaccine will put a microchip in you and the deep state will track us through 5G technology. There were the more realistic things that did happen, fanned flames of hatred and fear. I remember a news story out of Vail, Arizona, where people from outside of Vail, Arizona, busted in, essentially, to a school board meeting to bully the school board and the educators. Or on the other end of the spectrum, I remember on a day I was hiking in Sabino Canyon, there was a woman who had designated herself the mask police. That we were, it's a breezy day, people are outside, but she literally was yelling at anyone who was not wearing a mask. We didn't do so well on that test about being united or uniting. And if a student doesn't perform well on a test, we often wonder if there's been a failure of preparation. Perhaps the student didn't prepare for the test. Perhaps the educator or the system of education did not prepare the student for the test or a combination of all of those things. So I think about for us as a people or a nation, well, we are probably lacking in preparation around for some people, science education, or how government works, or simply the idea about what it means to love your neighbor and what that might look like, or that it's all right to turn off the cable news, or stop doom scrolling, as it's called, through social media, because all of it's designed just to rile us up, to keep us angry, left, right, it doesn't matter, because that keeps us watching and that keeps ad revenue flowing. That's what it's doing. It's not interested in uniting us or helping us love one another. So Jesus, in the story today, he goes through a time of preparation and testing. And he emerges united with God, with the truth of who he is, and ready to unite other people. He might know something about preparation and testing. And perhaps as we start this Lenten journey, we might learn some things from Jesus. So the story, as Steve was mentioning in the introduction to the scripture, the context is Jesus had just entered into the world, so to speak, at around age 30, and is baptized by John in the Jordan River, immersed in the water, but then also immersed in the Spirit of God. But it was not a, a one-time deal. It wasn't he got his spiritual high and then was just living on the memory of God once upon a time with him. Jesus stays connected with the Spirit. And we hear that the Spirit leads him into the wilderness for a time of preparation and testing. So he's paying attention to God and gets led before he starts his ministry and the work to a time apart. The wilderness represents in the biblical stories being, having stripped away the things that are part of everyday life. So some of us have maybe experienced that in the literal wilderness, maybe on a hike or a camping trip or backpacking, but it also can happen on a retreat, right? You let go of the everyday for a time, but it even can happen in your morning prayer or as you're gathered for worship in a sanctuary or online, letting go of the everyday in order to give focused attention to spirit, to who we are, to other people, so this is what wilderness represents in the story. So the spirit leading him to this place, to this space, 
before he starts the work. And the story said it was for 40 days and 40 nights, and that's one of those biblical numbers we've talked about, represents wholeness, completeness. It also likely resonates with a story we heard last week about Moses going up the mountain. Anyone remember how long he was up there? Right, past the test. So he's up there for 40 days, 40 nights, a fullness of time of being ready for what's next. And Jesus, it says he's fasting, and that's also praying. So Jesus, and that's traditional form, fasting and prayer. And the fasting is for the purpose, not of, of weight loss, but rather of a, another aspect of letting go of, of the usual, of the modes of survival of the everyday and making more room and space. And then we're, he's praying. That's what he's also doing. And there's, there's three gospel versions of this story. And he's praying. And a reminder, when Jesus is praying, it is not him just saying, now I lay me down to sleep or our father who art in heaven over and over again. That there's this whole gamut of what prayer is. What we might also call meditation or contemplation. There's probably chant and song and movement. All of that. All the practices that help one open to God. Doing that for this set apart amount of time. This is his preparation. The fasting and prayer. To be grounded and to be centered. And now comes the test. And you might say, wait, it said tempt. You're saying test. So the word that's here. It can be translated both ways, testing or tempting, and it's really amounting to the same thing. So he's going to be given a test, and the test is administered by, did you catch who it was? The devil. Now, there's questions, and I can't get into all of it right now, but wait a minute. God led Jesus to be tested by the devil? Wait, what's up with that? Might give a different spin to when we pray each week, lead me not into temptation? Or lead us not into temptation? Anyway, so... But that's, that's a whole other sermon. So the devil, there's lots of fascination with the devil. Um, and I grew up in the in United Church of Christ. Congregational churches did not hear much about the devil there. Um, though I went to, I've shared some stories about my aunt's vacation Bible school church. Lots of devil there. And so, but mostly the message is I didn't know much about the devil. And so there was just sort of this imagination. And mostly it was... Um, I liked Underwood chicken spread. Had a little devil. With, so that's what I pictured. Little red guy with the pitchfork and the horns. So there's always this kind of fascination with the devil. And um, let me say this for now about this. And I have, if you really want to do some devil research, which sounds weird from your pastor, I have some good resources, some good books about like the evolution of the character of Satan or the devil in scripture. But at this point in time, as people hear the word devil, they're not likely thinking the Lord of the underworld tormenting people forever in the pits of hell. That would be not the picture. That's not developed yet. So there'd be mixed pictures and then there's this evolution. But one way that I'd be thinking about it is the, and devil and Satan often get used interchangeably, but there's this character called Satan in the book of Job. And in that story, Satan is the lawyer working in the heavenly courts, who's testing Job. So there's some of that around. The word devil, diabolos, in the text, it, etymologically it means divider. And I think that's the most helpful way at this point to think about the story. That Jesus is being tested by the voices that could divide him. Divide him, separate him from God, from who he is as God's beloved. Right? He just heard, you're my beloved, I'm delighted in you. The voices in him and around him that could separate him from that and separate him from from other people. And so there's this idea he's come into this time of preparation, listening, and getting ready for his ministry, for the life he's about to live. And there's this opportunity to become familiar with the voices that could tear him apart or away from God, from who he is in God, and from other people. And so the test taking begins. And it's a really clever entry into this testing because Jesus has been fasting, which might mean he is hungry. So let's start with bread, Jesus. The temptation to make life about the bread, the physical, our own lives, or the focus for other people. Let's get them bread. Now, don't hear me too quickly. We need bread and sustenance and physical life. It's not just some sort of ethereal spiritual existence that we're meant to have. And we need it. You can't be very spiritual if you're dead, right? I mean, well, maybe. I don't know what happens next. <laughs> But our best bet is to be alive in order to live the way of Jesus. So 
So we have this picture, though, this idea of, well, just focus, though, on your own survival or helping other people have bread. And that's always something that we could just center ourselves in, right? Do I have enough? Do they have enough? And just stop there. And Jesus responds by saying no to that voice and says, humans don't live by bread alone, but by every word, the ushers from the mouth of God. There's a recognition in this that we're not here just to survive. We're here to thrive. And that God doesn't just want us to help other people only survive. Sure, start there. But then there's this thriving. There's this fullness of life. It gets called abundant life, eternal life. And that God is the part that's needed for that. So, yep, eat. Go ahead, eat. Right? Help other people eat. But if that's all we... There's plenty of people with lots of food who are evil and nasty and mean. So food is not salvation by itself. There's more. There's the listening for this word of God that transforms and leads and helps. So Jesus passes test number one. Test number two comes along, and it's got this bizarre imagery, probably for us, of up on top of the temple and throw yourself down and, and God will catch you. And a way I think about that, what's the real temptation here, is this idea that we might be full of ourselves and our pride, and we think, if we think about God at all, that God's job is to either bless the thing we decided already to do or clean up the messes that we make. But the idea is like, we're just doing it on our own. Off I go and, and God, you know, if I screw this up, help, you know, take care of it. And then collectively humans are messing stuff up all the time. And then we complain like, why didn't God fix this? And there's this idea of getting it backwards that Jesus is saying, that's not how it works. Where you just sort of like do whatever you want and test God to see how good God will perform. How about you listen first? How about we move with God. And so Jesus says no to that and says yes to not testing God, but sticking with God, moving with God, emerging into the world in and with God and living from that place. And there still will, can be mistakes, right? And we still can ask for help. But if we just only live our own way and then ask God to clean up the message, messes or only do what we want to do and ask God just to bless us, Jesus says that gets it backward. Test number two, pass. So then comes test number three, and these really are all related. They're just different angles on the same ideas. So the, the third one is, you know, I show you everything, and you can have it all if you worship me. And there's always that temptation to worship something other than God, to center in something other than the Spirit. There's always that temptation. And there's this idea, by the way, worship something else doesn't mean gather in a sanctuary with pews and sing songs. Right? I mean, we call this a worship service, but that's not all that worship means. Worship really means about where do we center our life? Where do we focus our energies? Where do we give our time and attention and efforts? And so there's always the temptation to make it about something else, to give it to something else that will result in fame or fortune or having a better vacation. I don't know, but we can always give ourselves to something else. And Jesus saying, no, worship God serve God. And then the other things fall into place. It's something he'll teach later where he says, seek first the reign of God and right relationship with God and the other things will be added unto you. So it's just about, it's not like you can't care about those other things. Just don't start there. Don't focus there. He says, focus in God. And then the other stuff falls into place. Test number three, it's a pass. You're with me. Pass. We vote. Does Jesus pass? Yes. So he passes the test. Well, what was all that for? Well, in one of the gospel stories, it wasn't Matthew. I like how at the end it says, the devil left him until an opportune time. And that gospel author gives us a hint about what the testing is for. It's really about what is all testing for? I mean, even the ones you hated, right? Think about, oh, here's the pop quiz on the chapter that you were supposed to have read in school. Well, why have that test? Because the teachers mean. No. It's to help us know what we know and help us be ready to move into the next chapter, to integrate, right? If we prepared for the test, if we've been taking it all on, to integrate the learning and then carry it into the next chapter, the next part. And that's what Jesus has been doing. So he takes this time apart to open to discerning the voices that could separate him from God and in a safe space, right? This is really prayer meditation time. He's learning, oh, what do I say? No to that one and keep saying yes to God. Oh, there's that one. I recognize it. Now I say yes to God. And all this prepares him for doing it in the field because it's going to come up again. 
And so there's this reminder for Jesus at the beginning of all this that he has to engage preparation and be ready for those voices. And now he knows, he's practiced what to say. And so it's a helpful story, I think, here at the beginning of our Lenten journey because there's this reminder that one, it's good to have preparation time. It's good to have time that is set apart. It is good to make space. The wilderness time, whether you go out into a literal wilderness or just have a candle lit next to your rocking chair looking out at the bird feeder, right? But to have those times of preparation, of centering, of listening, but that as we do, that we recognize and ask for even, help me to discern the things that could pull me away because we all have them. We all have those temptations to just make it about survival, And when we just make it about survival, there's scarcity and fear or the temptation to just kind of live full of ourselves and hope God will clean up our messes or the temptation to center our life or something in something other than God. And then we live in diminished ways and we might do some nice things, but we could do even better, more potent, beautiful, creative things centered in the spirit who is the author of beauty and creativity. Last week, I was talking at the end of the message about uh, an experience in my early adulthood where I started to see a therapist. And there's lots of things that therapy does, but one of the things that happened for me in therapy is by paying attention to some of like early childhood experiences, I started to identify the voices and messages that pulled me away from who I really was. The messages that could be about living in fear or shutting down or codependence or whatever. But I started this journey of understanding that there are things that keep me, that I've just learned and integrated that aren't the truth of who I am. And I was telling you last week that journey started at age 26 and it wasn't just, you know, one therapy session. I went through several and I've seen several therapists. But I will tell you, I still, the devil leaves until an opportune time. Because I'm I'm not 26 anymore. And just this past week, I had this experience where I just wanted to control and manage the situation. If I just think of all the possible outcomes and imagine all the possible future scenarios and then just do this and just do that, everything's going to be all right. Hell no. To you, that was, if you're new here, that was a sermon a few weeks ago. Right? But it's there. And if I'm unconscious, I just start to lean into that. And then I make a mess of things for myself, for other people. But there's daily preparation time, daily prayerful time. And that next morning, I understood, wait a minute, don't you go do that, Michael. That's an old way, an old pattern. That's just going to make a mess. Say no to that one. Keep saying yes to God, inviting God in, and move with the Spirit. And it was better for me. And you don't know it, but it was better for you too. And that's one of the gifts of following in this way with Jesus. God's better is better. And we're invited to join in the journey. And it's better not just for us, but for everyone. Because we live with greater generosity and beauty and justice and love. And that's good news. Come and see. Amen. In thanksgiving for God's gifts, we have this time of offering. We don't have plates passed to take tangible offerings. If you have something like that, we do have plates in the back as you're exiting and people also share monetary gifts online. But we are offering ourselves to this moment, to this time, to the music. So let us be in thanksgiving.